So we're here today with Pedro de Fonseca, founder of Black Gold Engineering. Thank you so much for making the time to meet with us. Thank you very much for having me. Actually, thank you very much for coming from so far and considering me for an interview. Of course. Most honored. Yes. So let's just start with what exactly does Black Gold Engineering do? Okay. So Black Gold Engineering was established in 2014. Uh, we are um, LED manufacturing company. And um, what we're trying to do is um, we manufacture LEDs and um, the technology around it was invented by myself. It's patented by myself. So we hold the patent on the technology. And the idea is to provide um, stronger, better lighting at less um, electrical consumption. Our current traditional lights compared to ours, we are in the range of 50, 70 percent less electrical um, consumption of electricity, but also um, we give out brighter light, longer lasting um, bulbs, you know, and this is to contribute towards the African struggle with the whole electrical needs and so forth. But um, it's not just good for us at home or Africa, it's good for the rest of the world. Yes. What was the process of um, developing the secret sauce? Because you said that <laughs> you created it, it's patented and all. Yes. So what was what does what did that process look like? Okay. Um, a few years back, I was tossed. So I was working as the resident electrical engineer for a local mine here in Namibia, and I was tossed with coming up with uh, electrical solution, practically on the lighting. We had lower lighting in certain parts that was um, production. It was hindering production during the night shift hours, so we weren't as productive during the day. And um, also the lighting was a bit poor quality for the people to work on that level, so we tried to incorporate other LED lights. But because of our heat and so forth, they would last six, four, six months and fail and so forth. So we had to come up with a suitable solution and also cost saving and, 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 and. So that prompted me to start looking into lights. So um, what happened is I went and I changed a bunch of lights into LED lights and so forth. But then when a few of them started failing, I actually started taking them apart to see how I can get, fix it, you know? But then I started seeing how inadequate the light is, you know, with the parts they use and everything. And I was like, yo, oh, this is bound to fail. And it's not made for Africa, firstly, and, 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 and. So <clears throat> my first idea was to start replacing the bigger components that consume electricity. And while doing this, I started designing the ICs that will then control or replace these parts. I sent my designs to Texas, um, Texas Instrumentation, and um, they were fairly impressed with how far I got along with that. Um, using my own salary, I was flying up and down. We got the things to a point where they were working. And then we started looking at incorporating everything together. So long story short, what my light actually does is that we have a single PCB, printed circuit board, with lights, with um, the integrated circuits on them, in other words, the power circuit, all working from one board. This is not seen commonly. Even though we've got very small render renditions of this, not of this size. Mine is the most powerful output light in the world right now, and this is why we've won 13 international awards for this. Um, so uh, <laughs> it was a long journey to get here, but finally we have perfected it. And um, once I thought I had gotten a solution, I did do some tests on my own, then I got the patent, and once I registered for the patent, some people got along and they got to read my patent and they asked me to perform on that and showcase my thing and then this took me from stage to stage to country to country and then I found myself representing Africa in different continents of the world, you know, where people were actually giving us praise for what we have done. That then led me to <clears throat> start my own facilities and build Black Gold Engineering to a point where we are today. You know, I like what you said. What you've just said, I found myself, which is 
Uh, which is, was a question I was already thinking about yeah. um, when you mentioned that you were working at this one place and you noted that there was there was an issue and you were trying to fix all the bulbs that were coming off, not mm -hmm. lasting for so long. And um, you started to, you were like, hmm, okay, let me take it apart and see what's up, what's going on in yeah. there. And did you ever at any point in your life before this um situation that led you to to get to here did you ever think that this is what you would be doing not specifically lighting i was um looking at going into um, electrical engineering consultancy and so forth the honest truth is that um, because of us being problem solvers and so forth there's always a problem to solve and we would like to offer these kind of services but then having applied myself to another problem and gotten, gotten this, no, I, I had no idea it would bring me this way. Like I said, I started from the back of my garage with all of this. Today, I've got 12 employees. I've got a warehouse, prospective clients, and the future looks bright. <laughs> yeah. Pun intended, future looks bright. <laughs> um, <laughs> How did you transition from working at the one company and then you, you say that you moved to the garage? What was that transition like from I am employed to I am an entrepreneur? That transition was the hardest. So um, just to be a bit personal, so I am married and I've got three kids. I've got a nine-year-old son and um, three-year-old twins. So when I decided to take this leap to leave my job, um, they were paying me actually quite well to not even seeing 10% of that. It was quite a pressure put on my family and myself. We had to properly change our way of life. But luckily or happily, my partner uh, was supportive, is supportive and um, it helped. Because the honest truth of being an entrepreneur, your very first uh, how can I say, the very first um, tension, the very first uphill you have to go through are actually your closest people. Everybody is going to judge your decision. Everybody's going to ask, are you crazy? You've got three kids. How are you going to take care of them? Boys weren't even one years old at the time. And I told them, look, it's now or never. Took the leap and um, I had proper support. And um, along the road, it was hard. It's not easy. This this road is not for the faint-hearted. You hear a lot of no's before one yes. And even the yes itself isn't as motivating or as encouraging. But the fact that somebody's willing to help, you know, you, you take it. You just need to be aware to not fall into all these unnecessary deals and so forth that happen in between and so forth. But if I had a word of encouragement to tell them, it would be that... Hold your head high, you know. For every uphill, there's a downhill. Okay? And um, it's always sweeter after the walk, after the experience, because then you've got a story to tell, you know. And this is why a lot of entrepreneurs and so forth share this, because of this walk, because of this stress, this pain. And that is the difference between tenderpreneurs and entrepreneurs, you know. One just goes for now, and the others are actually the, the changers, the movers. Yeah, so my walk has been long, but enjoyable. I am happy I went through it, because the experiences have built me so much that um, today I can actually rub shoulders with people, and I would know what the best position and walk for me would be going forward. You know, I love that you brought that up, because we've met with... Um, not so many, but quite a few entrepreneurs who have brought up the issue of mental health that comes with entrepreneurship. And um, are there any concrete examples of things that you were doing to help you stay sane? Well, <clears throat> to support myself during the time of me trying to start up the company, I did have to go back to my engineering roots. So I was doing electrical drawings and electrical um, installations and jobs and so oddly in and out and around. That sort of kept me relevant because I was still doing what I liked and it was still me being an entrepreneur. 
But the honest truth is um, your motivation comes only from yourself. Okay? If, if things didn't go well today and I wake up and I am demotivated and I tell myself, look, what's the use? And I stay in bed. Whatever you say will not get me out of bed. It is me. So your character, your focus, your mind it needs to be strong. You need to be your own source of power, your own source of motivation. I mean, you do have the sources around you. Like, for example, my, myself, what kept me properly there was that I kept looking at everyone I thought I was going to disadvantage because I now started this. So that had to keep me going. But at the same time, I was happy doing it, you know? So I also encouraged myself every day and so forth. We went through some proper rough patches. And um, there were those talks of, you know, go back to your employer, tell your old boss, I'm sorry, <laughs> kind of thing, where you start thinking and you tell yourself, no, not today, you know? Push more, another few months, <laughs> you know, just to try and make it work. And um, that, that is the thing you need. So essentially it is yourself. The other things just complement that, you know? But if you break down, no one else can pick you up. So head strong, you know, be strong. <laughs> yeah. um, about the 13 awards, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I would just be very curious as to what role that has played because I don't know, it's like what comes first, the success or the awards, right? I don't know, what role did that play in, in the work that you were doing? Okay, um, the awards were more of a motivator to myself that I'm on a path that the world actually recognizes or that I'm doing something that will be welcomed, you know? So that felt great. Um, just a bit of background. Um, I represented Namibia in the Inventors Fair 2017. I won first place. And then we went to the African Inventors Fair, which was in Cairo, Egypt, also 2017. When I was there, um, some, uh, what are they called, representatives of ARIPO. ARIPO is the governing patent, the governing board of the patents in Africa. And they asked me, Pedro, um, are you not interested to be on more an international level? Because they have never been able to send an African uh, inventor to the, um, what is it called? The Southern uh, CO International Inventors Fair. So at the time it's been, it had been running for 12 years and never has it had an African inventor. And it normally takes about 1,500 applicants. So we put in applications and you know, they accepted my application. Um, when I got there, they got me from the airport. Funniest thing was that they wanted to see if what I had shared with them was actually what I had. So my invention actually went in one car <laughs> and I went in another. <laughs> but when we got there, my store was put up and ready with all my information, which was good. I did the presentation of everything. And then what they did is they put precision meters to get the readings and stuff to make sure my light does what it does. And um, me using digital meters against precision meters, obviously I scored better results on their meters. So I won the best engineering project for the fair. First time, first African. It was motivational, I loved it. And um, Africa listened, you know. And from there, we moved stage to stage to stage, you know. So um, I am, like I said, a creative ambassador for Africa, best startup award winner, Southern Africa. Um, I've represented Africa, uh, Netherlands at Flash, at um, Copenhagen, UK, Japan, <laughs> sure, um, quite a few places and a number of them in Africa. And um, it complemented going on with the race and it motivated so many people doing it. You know that when you reflect on it, it's actually something that you find that everybody is actually looking at you no matter how small you look, you know? So we are happy. Um, I, like I said, I did say no to countless offers because um, my idea was that if I sell out to a foreign country, I become the for a foreigner, they become the bigger shareholders, and it becomes theirs, you know? 
And I'm not really chasing the success, I'm chasing the greatness of this. Um, you guys didn't know, so um, I was born in a refugee camp, you know, growing from those conditions, overcoming them, to being to where you are. You look at all the stories of the past, you know, and you want to wonder why is it that I can't be that, you know. So with greatness comes success and everything else follows. So that is where we're looking at. Um, it's not necessarily for the money, or the, but the fact that you will have your name edged in history, you know, legend, <laughs> that is what we're looking for. So um, my motivation in all of this is far different than a lot of entrepreneurs who just want to have a better life. And, and this is why I wanted to start this specifically in Africa, you know, to show them that we don't always have to go to Europe to be big, to sell out. If we do it here, we may be bigger here. Did you ever, um, at any point, live outside Namibia? Yes. Um, for my studies, uh, I got a master's in electrical engineering, which I acquired in Cape Town at uh, UCT. Um, and I spent about five years outside of the country doing my studies here. You've mentioned that you were born in a refugee camp. I would be very curious as to how you <laughs> Do you know the question I'm trying to ask? Yeah, how we overcame those fleets to be to where we are. Okay. Exactly. So um, my family is originally from Angola. My grandparents and my parents migrated here during um, the civil war that we had in Angola, broke out during the 1970s and so. They came and um, they were housed by the 32 South African Bata Battalion. So it was quite a big refugee camp. They stayed there for quite a number of years, where we were also um, part of. And then finally, when Namibia got independence, um, the South Africans went back, you know, and um, there was still a bit of racism during that time, but um, they were free to start working and so forth. So uh, my dad, being a qualified black man at the time, couldn't work as the qualified person he was, but he, he soldiered on. So he created certain possibilities for us growing up. So um, we had a good upbringing, um, school-wise and so forth. And um, he then later on transitioned into a businessman, which allowed us then to also, you know, um, I want to say, allowed us to go to a pretty good school and so forth. So conditions um, were created and we were able then to take from that. But now, all of that didn't just happen because um, my dad was this very good businessman and so forth. All of that happened because of understanding where we are and where we never want to be again. <clears throat> so he had that drive. I've got that drive, you know. Um, if he was riding a bicycle, maybe I should ride a motorcycle and then my sons would be able to drive cars. You know, we're trying to create this walk. So um, he gave me the tools I needed and I use them, and we're using those tools to go forward. You know, uh, there was a quote I, I remember, but I can't remember who said it. Um, where we come from does not limit where we're going, you know? Saying that I was born in a slum or I'm from a disadvantaged or impoverished family does not necessarily mean that you are incapable. You know, that just means that's your background. That's, and that's it. For me, that's just my background. It's not who I am, yeah. Um, I think we've talked a little bit about um, how your wife was very supportive and uh, all the other people that thought you were a crazy person <laughs> for choosing this route. So my question would just be, what, um, what would you say about the support system that you had mm -hmm. other than the one belief in yourself that you talked about as well? Yeah. What kind of support system did you have to make it this far? And um, especially if you had any mentors, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, so the support system I had here was immense, okay? Um, it started off slow. It was hard starting up. People need to understand and see your vision as well. And um, sometimes, when you have it in your head, it's so hard to get it out for people to understand. And then you come up with prototypes and they start understanding a little bit. But when someone of your level or higher than you also understands it and is willing to usher you, then everybody understands, wow, he was able to interest or play in this field. That helped. 
but um, the support helps you get there, you know. As much as I said, yeah, you had people first question you, and then after a while they see your determination, they see you soldiering on, and they feel, you know what, let's try and get behind it, maybe this can help and so forth. So I had a very good support structure from internal. And then while doing these routes and saying no internationally, I finally came back home and I started trying to pitch and sell from home. But home said no to me quite a few times, you know. Um, and then one day, there's a lady, a business lady here. Her name is Kaunan Dililua. She owns um, Business Financial Solutions. She called me up and she told me, listen, Pedro, um, I heard of your story. Congratulations. Um, sorry, I opened up for the Commonwealth Summit 2018 in London. So it, it, it came out well on the side of the newspapers and they wanted to know, you know what is happening? Where are you? We're hearing and reading all these stories. But So I explained to her what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do and everything and how difficult it's been. So she said, you know what, as of now on, you don't have to struggle with Wi-Fi, an office, telephone, whatever. I'll set you up in one of my offices. I was like, who is this crazy woman, you know? Read up on her and um, I found out she's actually one of the successful business people here. Together she took my hand, she introduced me to her finance advisor, she took me into some doors, she introduced me to potential people with Oftec. So we heard a lot of no's together. And then finally I got my main um, um, investor, which was through Baobab Capital and GIPF. And uh, that was just five months ago. And that's what I'm saying. Today, we're just sitting here. Yeah, you know, amazing things. So she has actually been, she's been amazing. She's been a mentor, powerful. And, um, you know, a woman as busy as she is and what she's doing, she chairs like four or five different boards. She runs three different companies, blah, blah, blah. She has time to pop up in here, find out how are you doing, what's going on, it's inspirational. So um, she says, seeing me do what I did has had her start her own startup fund, which she did two weeks ago where I spoke at. And yeah, so um, Miss Kanadi Lua, she has been a life changer actually. I'm getting emotional because I'm actually getting a chance to actually think of her role in my life, you know, so when she came on board, it's been running all the time and um, we actually haven't spoken like this about it. So it actually gets very, I, I know what she's done for me, the great, and I am great, grateful, but like I said, it's always been on the run, you know, so you'd be like, ah, oh, inspiration, tough woman. But now that I actually thought about it, you know, it's, she has been, you know, well, thank you so much for that share and for uh, being vulnerable with us. Um, when my wife sees this, she won't believe us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's very clear to me that you love this line of work in electrical engineering and you love finding solutions, um, but you're also very busy. I would say so. I would want. I would be curious as to how um, how much contact you have with the actual work right now versus in the beginning when you were doing quite literally everything. Well, right now I'm actually still on top of everything. Even though um, now it's become a situation where you have to lead a whole team and you've got people to do what you appointed them to do. Um, the marketing of it, of the product, the R&D research and development of the project, testing of it, it's still with me. A lot of the engineering is actually, all of the engineering is still with me. So um, we've got the people looking at um, manufacturing my final designs, but the designs are still done by me. I've got the team at the assembly line that they work on and so forth. And um, so they are taking care of everything that happens here while I'm out there, you know, trying to get the product out and clients and so forth. So um, I'm still hands-on with it and I'm still hands-on on the business. I feel that um, maybe we're still too young to completely let go of everything. But then again, I'm young, so I don't think letting go of everything is really, yeah, so 
plus scaling we're learning as we're growing so um, yeah, we're still pretty hands-on yeah. let's talk about the product i think the one that i know is the street light right yes. so yes. maybe we can talk about that and what other products that you have okay so um just for you guys to have a look um this is my actual street light my final street light this is called my namlux street light model so just to give yourself uh, some understanding that um, it still mounts onto the pole like a normal street light. It's got a daylight switch to help it switch on and off. It's got an aluminium casing to help with the reduction of heat and so forth. And as you can see, it has got no bulky um, compartment to house a driver, a ballast, a capacitor, any of the huge consumers of electricity. That's totally been omitted. We've got three of my roses inside, which are the LED ones, and all the power circuits are on the PCBs itself, as well as the lights. And that does everything. And this is where... So this is our very first product, which is um, the Namlock Street Lights, and that's, that's what it does. Um, we do... I will take you guys down on there, but um, just to give you a background on the other two products, We've got a downlight domestic light Namlux series also coming out. What the domestic light does is um, it practically takes your standard light bulb, the 60 watt light bulb, and we provide brighter light, but on a 3 watt PCB board. So it literally cuts it down. <laughs> I read 70%. <laughs> exactly. And it gives you the brighter, better light. So. What we're trying to do with this series is we're trying to incorporate every single light fitting that we have in our domestic houses so that you don't go and change what you have at home. You just replace the light bulb you got there with ours. So whether it's a GU10 downlight or a screw-in light bulb, we will be able to accommodate for that and um, um, provide for that. Uh, we have done the test. We have done the prototype and um, we have put it out there in the market and it was well received. We are now busy with our final look. In other words, we, are, we have designed the look and we're just producing it so that we can get it out. So in the next two to three weeks, hopefully, we'll have a fully formed design of our download series for now I can share pictures. And then our third um, fitting is called our Namlux um, UFO series. So it's a high bay light. In other words, used for industrial use in um, warehouses and so forth. Again, competing with um, the very powerful instrumentation we got on uh, current conventional street lights. Our high bay light is able to reduce that. In this case, a bit more than 70% because we got a 100 watt um, high bay light that can replace your 2000 watt um, high bay light that you conventionally have. So we're very excited for that. Um, we got them coming up in a few warehouses currently, but um, also uh, still in the test phases. But come January 2020, we'll have final products and we'll come out to that. Yeah. Exciting times. <laughs> <laughs> It is. Uh, how can one uh, purchase your product? All right. Um, we do have a site. It's uh, www.bge.com.na. We will be advertising our products on there, and then we will be getting an online shop. Um, otherwise, for at the moment, we've got an inquiry um, page. So if you're interested, you can actually log on and go ahead and request for a quote or anything and we will be able to communicate directly and so forth um, otherwise my email addresses and so forth are there as well so you can always hmm. are you selling internationally we have got regional and well, african exposure and we haven't crossed the african borders yet uh, we were invited to Germany for the light show taking place in March, where they would like us to come and display our products and so forth. 
So hopefully on an international scale of that level, we might get more off takers. For now, we've got our local brothers and sisters very much interested. So um, outside of Namibia, in Africa, we've got some interests. But internationally on the world market, we haven't sold the product yet, but we're looking to, make, to be part of it very soon. I would just like the record to reflect that when you come to Germany in March, we will be there. And <laughs> <laughs> I hope that we can meet there as well. <laughs> yes, no, no, that would be much appreciated seeing um, yeah. familiar faces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what's the vision now? I would like to say that I want to go into solar lighting, you know, because it's something that we do need here and so forth. Uh, we are currently working towards that. The R&D phase for solar is very expensive, <laughs> you know, so um, it's just things we need to overcome to see how we can make it work with our technology and solar to not make it inexpensive for our own people. Because you may come up with a very good design, but because of, you know, the, the materials used and so forth, um, it doesn't, the end result is too expensive for our market. That's not what we want to do, but um, the future, well, I hope that we can keep growing. Um, integrate my lights with some apps and fintechs, you know, uh, we're busy talking to an, uh, a company to see if we can switch our domestic lights on and off from an app on our phone while you're on holiday so that you can have the appearance of people are present, you know, switch on the porch lights, switch on the room lights. And so, we are looking at, um, what do they call it? Smart city solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Possibilities in this. I'd be very curious just to learn more about the financing side because it's something that, you know, either people bootstrap mm -hmm. uh, or they look for investment or what we've heard a lot uh, in the past interviews is, as you have also done, is they work a full time job and then mm -hmm. use their salary to finance. The, the, the prototype, yes. but then what was the next step and how did you finance that? Okay, so um, like I said, after meeting Ms. Kauna Dilulua, what her team actually did for me is they changed my business profile, my financial forecasts and everything so that it's more acceptable to the financial sector of um, the place. So when I went and approached some businesses and banks and so forth, people were actually able to relate and see what it is I want to do. So when we got our financiers on board, they were able to see how we can scale the product, you know. So um, um, they were able to understand through the models and everything created. So um, they came in as a VC, a venture capitalist. Um, they are giving me, they gave me the startup and everything to take it to the next level. So um, they've got shares in my company, obviously, and we've got a partnership and agreement that I've got 36 months to turn this into a profitable company. Like I said, we are only five months in and um, it's looking good. Um, the response coming back is good as well. Uh, we have put out certain samples, you know, for people to get a look at and so forth out there which the response came back well so um, the finance is happy scaling so this is why I was able to get my investors actually to also fund two more products you know because they saw the potential in those markets so um, from my side I feel that um, the finance came through at the right time and now we are able to work at it um, we just I had uh, people look over my contracts, you know, because you need to be careful with what you're giving back, what your rate and return is, because your company might be doing good, but because you overcommitted yourself to your financiers, you might lose your company to that or something like that. Otherwise, um, for my part, I was fortunate enough to have a very skilled mentor that was able to provide me with what I needed to actually secure a proper deal. So that's more or less what the finance looks like for my side, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice to other African inventors? Don't be afraid to share. Um, 
as an engineer, um, when I was starting up, my problem was always, I registered a patent, but if I give away too much, this person might run with my idea, and then, and then, and In actual truth, that is just a crutch to myself, you know? If you're open to share, some people aren't in there to steal from you. They just want to be part of the journey and part of this. So they are willing to, you know, hear a good story, be motivated, fund it, you know, and help you get to your next level. Um, it is no use to hide what you have and then die with an idea that could have been uh, life-changing to, 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 to the rest of us, you know. So um, do it carefully, be cautious, but don't be afraid to share. Don't die with your idea, you know. Make sure you come up. Make sure you're that person who was able to escape, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> in a nutshell. I'm very curious about your process of re-engineering because you were not afraid, like your curiosity drove you to take the, something that was not working apart yeah. uh, and also to look at, okay, what, what do the different components cost? How does it actually work? Do you think that's applicable to any product to make it more fitting for the African continent? Well, <clears throat> to tell you the honest truth, they asked me the same thing. What was I thinking when I started this project? And the honest truth was that a lot of people follow the conventional way of doing things. You know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. You only notice a street light when it's off. <laughs> you never really see it. It becomes such a part of your environment, you don't even consider it. So um, being where we are with the problems we had, it led me to look into it. And I feel that this can be applied to anything that someone is able to just give attention to, you know. A lot of the products we use in Africa are all imported. You know, they are either from India, China, Europe, America, you know, everything from abroad. Doesn't mean they're perfect, they're just convenient, you know. So if you can take something, adapt your knowledge to it, uh, you'll be able to make it better. So I think um, it, it, it is scalable to that level, yeah. Today, if you could partner with anyone, who would you partner with and what would you ask them for? Sure. <clears throat> I would partner with Boeing, <laughs> the aircraft company. Um, reason being, Boeing has got some of the most successful companies working to put it together. The engines are made by Rolls-Royce. Uh, the seats are made by Ring Caro, and I would like to come and do their electrical lighting. If I've got my lighting on an aeroplane, good enough for that. That means I can do my lighting on cars, on stadiums, on the rest of the world, practically, you know. Um, because, you know, the safest mode of traveling is aeroplanes. We trust it with our life to have such a heavy thing up in the air. So everything that goes into it is carefully selected and, and, and to be part of such a team, it's almost like being part of NASA, you know, and so forth. But um, so Boeing would be the team. And um, like I mentioned, NASA, the one person would most probably be Elon Musk. Um, a person, well, originally from Africa, now in the States and so forth. But because he was also able to make such an international name for himself. You know, how good would it be to partner up and create a synergy of African inventors and entrepreneurs for the rest of the world to start understanding we're not just about farming and mining <laughs> and so forth. So that would be the one person and that would be the one company. Wow, thanks for sharing. Thanks. What is the, what is the biggest learning that you had from building this company? to the point where it is right now? Sure, that nothing comes easy. That which is easy doesn't last. You know, during my walk, we do go to bed and we are hopeful and we do pray that this happens and this, but then after a while, you know exactly what it takes for it to happen. So you don't need to be hopeful or pray, you need to act and that means doing this, putting in the time, getting there, and that helps you plan, 
it helps you um, start uh, knowing how to cover certain things. When I left my job to start this, I will tell you I was blissfully ignorant because I didn't know anything. I didn't know what it took and everything. But then now that I'm here, you know, and you can actually tell people it doesn't come in the wink of an eye. A lot of people saw me at a celebration and I was talking and people were congratulating me. And he was like, yeah, I saw you in the news recently. Huh? It's, uh, what did he say? It's uh, uh, um, overnight success. I was like, overnight, right? <laughs> I've been at this four and a half years, you know? So um, it's not been an overnight success. It, it's, it's, it's been hardships, you know, and so forth. Like, uh, I'm not even afraid to say it. We had, uh, there was a point where um, I was getting evicted out of my house, where I didn't know where me and my wife and my children were gonna move into. You know, um, we had points where they were re coming to repossess my furniture and so forth, you know. So it wasn't always highlights and everything. So we had to find ways in which to work and overcome these fleets, you know. And um, people will think it's overnight because they don't know the hardships that you got through and everything. But I also feel that because a lot of entrepreneurs don't really share that, people still think it's easy to get to where they think, ah, let me write a business plan, I'll take it to a bank and I'm sorted. <laughs> Shame, doesn't work that well. Yeah, so this has taught me quite a lot. Uh, personally, it's built my character so much. Um, I heard a video recording of myself trying to talk about where I want to be in the future. And I was telling myself, my guy, he was so young. <laughs> I had no idea. So I, I could actually relate to that, to where I am now, you know. So there is no shortcuts in life, you know. This is not easy. And the only way is through it. You just need to make sure that you are well equipped mentally, psychologically, physically, and with the right team, you know, to go through this. So. I mean, I love that share, but let me ask one follow-up question. Do yeah. you think this blissful ignorance is mm -hmm. necessary to start in the beginning with this naiveness, with this lightheartedness, yes. without knowing how it will work out? Funny enough, I was talking to my team about it. I told them blissful ignorance is the one thing that motivates and helps us. You know, if you wake up with an idea and you are happily motivated that it will work, not thinking about the, well, the precautions and everything, you actually jump into this, both feet into the river. You don't even test, you know, <laughs> you run with it. You do everything you can, can to get going until you finally get stuck, you know, but a lot of the time cause you started that process. It keeps you going. And that comes from the blissfulness, the ignorance, sorry, which we have, which is good. You know, a lot of the times, if you were to get a mentor way before you start, Maybe your route won't be as uh, adventurous, you know. But I feel the blissful ignorance needs to be there. It's the one way you learn and it's the one way you grow, you know. You need to hit your head a few times and you need to be young for it. So it's, it's, it's a good one. Yeah. Uh, you already gave your advice to uh, young African inventors. But <laughs> what would be your advice to young Namibians uh, today? Um, I feel that um, I went to Asia and um, uh, I was talking to the Chinese and they told me, they told me, yeah, they don't have an off day. You know, they work seven days a week. Okay. And I was like, interesting. And they said, yeah, even the school's there, seven days a week. You go to school Monday to Friday, but Saturday and Sunday you have online classes for two to three hours. So the kids... I stimulated and active all the time and everything. So I was like, sure. Compared to that, that makes us Africans lazy. And then they told us, no, Africans are the happiest people out there. I was like, what? They were like, yeah, you guys are having war, but you guys are singing. You guys are malnutrition, people dying of hunger, but you guys are always happy, you're always celebrating. And then and I actually felt empowered at that because they were trying to say that the whole world is pilgering and making riches off us. And even though we know it is, even though we see it, we're still happy. 
we still have culture, we still have our music, we still live our lives and everything. And I don't want us to lose that. So I would tell them, try to incorporate everything you can without losing that aspect of yourself, you know? And Namibians need that because, you know, everybody now wants to be like the Western world and and and. So um, we need to be ourselves. So if you're going to be a business person, if you're gonna be an inventor, if you're gonna be whatever you're gonna be, you know, just incorporate your own flair to it. And um, yeah, and I think that that is what I want to tell them. They be that. <laughs> yeah. How oh, powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. No stress. No you stress. know, when you started that, I really thought you were going to say, no, you must work every day, guys. <laughs> but I'm glad it went the other way. <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth is that there is work involved. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, but yeah. don't don't lose yourself in work. It's it's yeah. about having fun. I, I I knock off from here, and I'm not too tired to still socialize. I'm not too drained or upset or you know to still integrate, and that's the beauty of working. Um, well, with what you love, you know. Instead of going to a job where you moan and complain and you're just depressed, and then when you go out, you want to drink and just be sour and whatever. No. It's not necessary. So that's what I'm saying. You're going to do this. You keep your head up. Do it with flair. Take that with you. Don't lose a part of you to trying to do what is not. Yeah, you know. So. So one other random fun question. I mean, I think I could say. Yeah. Is there a number of times you remember that you tried and tried and tried before you finally hit the jackpot with the, your uh, product? Sure. Failure was so common in my, <laughs> in my, um, in my, well, in my journey that um, I didn't even see it as failure anymore, you know. And out of it, it actually helped me realize certain things. Like, for example, um, we were trying to work out the heat dissipation on how it could not retain and keep all the heat for the components to burn out. And I tried so many things and I failed at those, but it showed me how I was actually getting more closer to the solution. So there wasn't, there was failure to the sense that we didn't get there immediately, but there was a learning curve, you know? Like Einstein said, I found 1,000 ways not to do it, you know, until I found the right way to do it. But during that 1,000 ways, he was learning everything else. And um, yeah, so it, it has been an immense struggle, a learning curve, but inexplicable to where it led me, you know. And to tell you the truth, it's made the product better. Yeah. I find it very, a very powerful share and interesting because with things that don't come easy and don't come fast, yeah. You have to find different metrics for measuring success. So yes. uh, did I learn something or did I get a little <laughs> further, a little better than the last time yes. that lets you know I, I'm successful? You know, other people might say, no, I failed again, but no, I'm, I'm already <laughs> successful yes. because I'm, I can see that somehow I'm approaching the outcome that I'm, that I'm striving for. Yes. So I will tell you, um, my actual light <clears throat> had a lot more LEDs and a lot more components on it. And... Um, I remember I was trying to find out how to regulate and have maximum flux output out of my LEDs at the lowest consumption of electricity. And um, the formula was eluding me a little bit. So I was flying as on a 13 hour plane from Hong Kong and the solution came to me. So now I'm in the plane, I don't have a pen or a notebook, I'm not in my garage on my laptop to test my theory so my anxiety is going crazy i'm pacing and i'm trying to do voice recordings on my phone so i don't forget <laughs> you know but at the same time you have found the solution so it comes to you at the most awkward times but um because of the failure you know you actually can now figure out the next route and um, that's what I learned. And that's how you actually tell yourself, sure, what would have happened if I didn't do that? You know, you would have gone another route and you would have never actually gotten to where you are. So the failure 
helps. It, it's like um, steel sharpening steel, you know. So what would be your take on um, the correlation between how much education you need to have to be able to be an entrepreneur? Because I think, for example, for creating this LED light, you must have a certain depth of knowledge to be able to figure that out, right? So what would you credit that to? Would you credit it to your studies abroad? Would you credit it to... Uh, I don't know what what would I you would credit it to. I would say it's part, it's part of everything. There's an experience to it. You know, I've been. My affinity to electricity has been from a young age. You know? So there's experience to it. There is studies to it, and then there's the love of it. You know, um, we had a lecturer that used to say that engineering is um, creating something out of nothing. Otherwise, you're just taking other people's theorems and work and applying them in your everyday, which means you are just a vessel of what somebody needs for you to make it happen. You know, and I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be my own kind of, you know, so there was that ambition. And then because of what I understood, which most likely came from my studies and also my interest in that, you know, so I wouldn't say you need extensive studies. I would say that if you have, if you have um, a passion for something, you know, um, align yourself with it, you know, do it, understand it, and then you can create whatever you want from it. So. I have one more, one more question, you know, just because it came to me that the, uh, the, the, the stories of the struggles, you mm -hmm. know, and our biggest fears is, okay, I will run out of money, mm -hmm. I will get evicted, mm -hmm. etc. And you shared that, that you also had to struggle and you said, they came to evict you from your house or you know repossess some of your belongings. My question would be, what happened after that? Because you're still here, you're still alive, <laughs> and you know, for many entrepreneurs, like this is like the unspoken biggest fear: I run uh -huh. out of money, and then what? You know, what comes? Yeah. Do you fall into an abyss, or you know, what what, what happened afterwards? To tell you the truth, it is a certain. Uh, there is a certain breakdown you go through, you know, but then you need to realize that you need to get out of this. Um, you need to look for the opportunity in this. I will tell you now, a lot of um, entrepreneurs, they, they, they start something, they go through it, it goes bust, it falls, they fail, but then they get right back onto it, it becomes a success, and then they jump right into another project where it's bound to fail, bound to succeed, but they're willing to take that risk. After all of that, okay, so you do fall into a abyss. You have to find your way out of it. You need to climb out of that hole, you know. So like I said, mentally strong, firstly. Um, I am a very happy guy. Uh, <laughs> um, a lot of people who don't know me tell me, whoa, you're pretty excited today. And the people around me are like, ah, oh, this is just Pedro every day, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> I'm serious. Um, my... Um, my finance manager, lady just walked in and out, she also tells me, ah, we need to be serious, we need to be serious. So honestly, you need to work at it in such a way that you can still get yourself out of there. When I was going through that, I was like, okay, I had, I had uh, the, uh, well, the potential to call um, the people I owed and I told them, listen, things aren't going so well, please give me another month, I'll try to find something, I'll try to do something. And I tried and whatever. And they came, people wanted to repossess their things. And then I got my notice of eviction. You know, come a few weeks from now, you'll be evicted. But you can't let yourself fall into that hole, you know. At the same time, you're still getting people calling you, asking you to come to product presentations, and they're ready to align themselves with you. And you keep telling them, listen, just, just one more week. And then, and, and then you get out of that hole. You finally get to overcome this and pay these things. And you start rising. And you are ready to throw yourself back into a potential risk where you're going to fall because you know that, man, you can only get up better. You can only get up harder. You know, you can only hit back. Yeah, so that's the, 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 the outlook I took. Um, yeah, so actually before I signed this deal with my financiers, my wife said, what exactly are you throwing away? 
you know i thought well, i don't know maybe my left kidney <laughs> will find out <laughs> but the honest truth was she wanted to find out is this going to implicate us into more debt if things don't work out and then and she was trying to be more realistic about this as be more optimistic as like this is our chance you know grab it with three hands if i could and if i fall during doing it i would know why and i'd get up and try my best to get out of it so um approaching these kind of things it's all about the will for it and uh you know it's like people get have survivor stories that they used to skydive and then parachute didn't open and they fell and they survived and they're still doing it you always have to keep putting yourself out there because you come back stronger and the love for it is better overcoming something is you know the joy you have for yourself <laughs> yeah so um i i would put myself like i am i'm putting myself out there again you know i'm I mean a warehouse I got 12 employees I'm mean, responsible for their salaries and their families and they've got their trust and hope in me and you know you're scared and excited at the same time you know you go out there um I had um my cousin he looked at me and he said congratulations and I told him why he's like from 2014 a dream to 2019 a reality you know and he goes like and you're an employer my guy you know and that touched me and I was like yeah and I was like yeah let's do this so even though it's it's scary it's you know it's new we excited for it you know these are the things you want yeah Do, does it feel like it's been uh so many lifetimes since 2014 yo yeah the stories one could write you know you know the stories one could write with it um these experiences from the whole life i've had to just the past 4 years have been a complete difference i mean firstly i had never traveled like i have in these few times you know i have never incited and been on stages and spoken to people and been able to you know be part of this community that people now look at and being considered somewhat inspiration or you know it so it has been a complete different life changed it sure you know if i was to 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 end things today i'd still be happy because of uh, what we have done going through that you know i would have said that um we have had a full experience just because of that you know and um, yeah so it is it's been too many lifetimes <laughs> great ones Okay, I have one more story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um just because you mentioned that it's you've never experienced life in this way before and you were at you are at such you have been put at such Uh, a great stage i would say in front of all these Exposure, people yeah. and audience and so on did you ever get um imposter syndrome imposter syndrome you'll have to help me with that as okay, in, uh, i don't even know how to explain it that well myself mm-hmm. but it's it's where you you get to a place and you feel like you're not supposed to be there um, just because it's so great and I so see. outside of yourself well i don't I don't want to say that um it was imposter uh syndrome for me it was more asking myself how did I get here you know how did I get here in the stands like I was just asking myself how is it possible you know uh, at the end of the day you don't understand um one of the awards that I won that I really cherish was um the creative business ambassador creative business ambassador so I got on stage and just to share a second of that I told them that um creativity is not just arts fashion and 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 it is actually everything that you are able to implicate and touch in people's lives you know i mean a bank coming up with a innovative uh, sort of loan thing to to help people ease their lives and 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 I spoke about that and um then we had the the creative business competition 
And the creative business competition is to see the cre creativity all around the world and all these different people. But they didn't have an African ambassador yet. So it was in Kenya <laughs> and we're there. Um, it was, it was we were a bunch, so many people from East, West, North, Southern Africa and so forth. And I got on stage and I presented my product. So they had the first, second, third winner. They called them up on stage and everything. And I was like, oh, well, you know, they did great and I did great and so forth. And then they said, so we're doing things different this year. So because they feel that this presentation was totally different and on a different level and category, they couldn't honor me with a number one position, you know, so they have decided to select an African ambassador for Africa now. And this is Pedro da Fonseca, congratulations. You know, we feel that you have demonstrated that, you know, we are no longer looking at all these different solutions like recycling and then it way surpassed that because I'm trying to look for a way to better not just my life. And they were like, so that, that shocked me at that, at that level. And I was like, how on earth did I get here? I represented Africa in Copenhagen, at The Hague in Netherlands, and, 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 you know, and the whole time I kept asking myself, how? But people were so intrigued. People were so interested. But, and you still keep asking yourself, how? Like, do you deserve this? Is this worth it? But like I said, um, all of that is just more fuel to the fire that you are actually going in the right direction. So, um, yeah, I use it for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure and amazing.